National Press Club. I don't know how many of you have ever been down there in Washington. It's sort of the center of you know professional journalism in uh, in America, or used to be anyhow. And um, it was always the place, and still is, where like if a famous person comes to town in Washington, they do their speech there to get maximum publicity. And until uh, 1955, women were not allowed to even set foot. And it wasn't just that they couldn't be members. They could not put a toe in the building. Only allowed about and until 1971. Which drives me nuts because in 1971, I was already working in the business. And when I think back on those days and all the fights that there were, I realized that I was totally useless. I did nothing really whatsoever. I, I was in Connecticut. And uh, I had just started a news service up there. And uh, we worked out of the state capitol. And in those gorgeous, glorious days of Europe, there were so many people covering the state capitol in Connecticut that they couldn't fit them all in the press room. Um, now, you know, they can set up camp in the press room when they got down there. But there were lots of people there back then. And so we were put in the overflow press room, which was up in the garret of the attic of the state capitol. And uh, the only other thing up there was a room called the Hawaiian Room. It was, it was awful. God, it was like one pipe running through the middle of the room with some plastic ladies hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Hawaiian Room. Somewhere. But the point was you could serve liquor there. And it was men only, and it was where the lobbyists and the legislators got together and drank. So there was the Hawaiian Room and there was us. But we were there until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. We were working like banshees. And everybody else was long gone home, and there was only a men's room up there. So one night at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I put up a sign that said, this is now a unisex staff room, so just <laughs> watch when you go in. And the Hawaiian room the next day got a look at that. They were very upset, and I came back that day, and there was a big sign saying, men only. So we got a helper from one of the women down in the Senate office, and we found out that there was a law that said that you could not have a floor of a state building without a bathroom that was accessible to the handicapped. So I pointed out that if there was a handicapped woman, who, why she would want to go to the wine room would be beyond me, but if there was a handicapped woman <laughs> on the floor, she would not have had access to a bathroom. So I put my protest in, and uh, a day or two later I came back, and there was a big sign on the bathroom that said, this facility is for men and handicapped women. <laughs> so that was my achievement for the women's movement in our profession. Um, while I was doing very little, the, the, everything else changed so fast. I mean, every, when I wrote the last book, I wrote it because I was so amazed. If you look back 50 years at what life was like for women, in this country and for women in the professions. It was, 50 years ago, it was perfectly legal to um, discriminate against women in hiring. You could, in fact, the, um, the federal government had women only and men only job classifications. And you know, the guys ones were all the good ones. And of course, in the Times and all the other papers, there were help wanted men and help wanted women. And uh, the men had the engineering and architecture jobs, and the women had the receptionist jobs. And it was perfectly legal. Well, you couldn't get credit if you were a woman. And it was perfectly legal to, um, to tell a woman that there was a woman in New York who applied for credit in 1960-something. She had a job. She wanted to rent an apartment. It wasn't even a credit. She wanted to rent an apartment to get a lease. In order to get the lease, they made her go to the mental hospital where her husband was a patient to get him to co-sign the lease. <laughs> because women could not sign leases in their own name back 50 years ago. Um, there's, um, God, there are so many horrible stories. <laughs> when I was in college in the late 60s, we could not leave the dormitory in slacks unless we were going bowling. <laughs> and I didn't protest. I just signed up for bowling every day. But it, was, it was an amazing time. And in, the, in our profession, in journalism, it was very unusual for a woman to have any job that didn't involve uh, women's stuff. You know, being, and in advertising, women could get jobs if it was Tampax that you were writing copy for, but um, not for very much of anything else. And then things changed almost overnight in a 10-year period, basically. We went from the same basic vision of women, places in the home, 
weaker than men, need to be led, need to be helped, to where we are basically today. It happened almost overnight. And the reasons it happened so fast were, first of all, the civil rights movement. Uh, the civil rights movement is people digested what had happened in this country and been legal in regard to African Americans. It weirdly made them very sensitive to issues of fairness. And if you could, to this very day, if you can prove to this country that something's not fair, you pretty much won your argument, no matter what it is. And also, there was this one brief shining period when I was happy enough to be sort of coming into the world when authority figures had no confidence in their ability to tell anybody anything, especially in the Northeast and the West, because of that same sense that, you know, we enforce laws, you know, for segregation. You know, what do you, who are you to tell me this or that? They began to just lose faith because all of these old laws and old ideas were kind of crumbling around them. And I have one story I've got to tell you because it's my favorite story that I have ever found in my entire life about this period and this issue. And it started with uh, a story in the Times. You know, the Times loves trends. Three things happen and it's a trend. You know, so you go out and find three instances. In 1968, we had a story in our paper about a new trend that was totally shocking and amazing. They had discovered, the reporter had discovered, that in New York City, college students of opposite sexes were living together in the same apartment. <laughs> it was known as cohabiting, and they had interviews with three cohabiting couples. All of them used pseudonyms because this was so shocking at this point in time. But one of the stories, uh, the, the, I forget what their phony names were, Peter and Sally or something, that gave out way too much information, and Barnard instantly realized that this was a sophomore named Linda LeClaire. So they called Linda LeClaire, and she had told them that she was going to live with family relatives for whom she was going to work as a nanny in the evenings. Um, and that's how she got out of being in a dorm, because everybody had to live in a dorm back then. Uh, they called her in, and Linda did not apologize. She started to picket the school, the administration building. She argued perfectly reasonably that the guys at Columbia had no hours at all, but the girls at Barnard had to be in at 9 o'clock at night every night, and that it was crazy. She wasn't going to do it. It wasn't fair. So she's picketing. The New York Times is covering this story as if nuclear war was about to break. I'm <laughs> telling you how thrilled my paper was with this story. So every moment they are on it. And gradually, the alumni start to write in to the president of Barnes saying, what is going on here? This woman is breaking the rules. She's living with a man. It's not right. What are you doing about all this? And the poor president didn't know what to do because it was that age. She wasn't sure really whether she still had the right to tell people where you should live or who you should sleep with. She just didn't know. So she formed a blue ribbon committee <laughs> <laughs> with um, administrators and faculty and students on it. And they met. Of course, the Times is taking notes as every meeting is going on. They finally announced their decision, which was that if Linda LeClaire did not come back immediately to the dormitories and apologize, she was going to be permanently banned from the snack bar. <laughs> Stay home. 
home with her kids, thought about the fact that whatever, if she could do it right now, she wouldn't be able to do it if her husband got laid off and she had to be prepared. The moment that all those things happened, everything changed forever. Our mission in life became the same as men's mission in life, and it wasn't an ideological decision. It wasn't, it was the way of the world, and the whole point was that women rose to that and instantly grabbed those opportunities and ran with them and created an entirely new world that the, the way things were was the way things had been since the Middle Ages. The vision of women that existed when I was born was the same vision that existed in the year 1000. It, you know, women are weaker. There are exceptions. There are exceptions here. There, Queen Elizabeth I did a great job, but <laughs> <laughs> women are weaker. Men are stronger. Women need to be home. Men have the public world. Men rule. Men lead. Women follow. Women defer. Yada yada yada. And that was the vision forever. And it changed in my lifetime forever. I am absolutely, totally confident, permanently forever. That huge thing that dictated the future of virtually every little baby girl that was ever born changed in my lifetime. And it changed for the younger women to have a platform to leap off onto into a different kind of world. And every time I think about that, it just knocks me out, despite the fact that I'm a professional complainer. <laughs> and I can tell you very easily all the horrible things that are going on that are totally wrong, 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 wrong. But that, that just, you know, luxuriate in that once in a while. It's so amazing to me. Now, the one other thing that you needed to get this change to happen was a generation of women leaders who were not afraid to be laughed at. Because, you know, in the women's movement, you know, nobody shot at you. Nobody tried to burn down your house. It wasn't like the civil rights movement. What they did was to make fun of you. They laughed at you. They said you couldn't get a man. They said, you know, you, you had funny shoes. You, yeah, yeah. They, you know, they just, it was all silly. It was, you know, women getting carried away, they were too emotional, and yada, yada, yada. And the women who were not afraid to stand up to that were the women who made this change. And I've often invited, sort of when I give talks, somebody will ask me a question that's basically an invitation to tell what I suffered as a woman trying to move up in journalism. And the answer is not at all, except for that bathroom incident. <laughs> I, it was so easy for me because women who came along one second before me in my profession opened the door for people like me to walk through. They filed the suits. They got in the face of the editors and the publishers. They carried on. They demonstrated. They embarrassed their newspapers and magazines in order to get justice for the women who worked there. And they almost never got the rewards because they had ticked everybody off. The people who got the rewards were people like me who came in one minute after when they were looking for somebody to show that they weren't being discriminatory, but preferably not the people that had driven them crazy over the last couple of years. And I know so many of those women who made those fights, and they're not bitter. They're bitter at the paper. They're still totally pissed about it. <laughs> they're not bitter about what happened. They are so proud and so pleased at what's come after them. They are so delighted every time a woman gets a great job or makes some great new advance and becomes famous and does some amazing thing. They're so happy about it. To me, that's the definition of a great heart. Somebody who can take pleasure in other people getting the stuff that you wanted to get and fought for. And I'm so proud to have been the person who got all the stuff from all those women who are so amazing. I mean, and I just wanted to celebrate them with you tonight because your organization is one of the places that's always celebrated them, that's always helped them. And it's a great, other things will come up. They always do. And it's just a great, 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 great tradition. And I want to thank you all for the work you did. And thank you for having me here tonight. I applaud you for giving Catherine this honor. She will be fantastic and wonderful. And wish you just a great year. Thanks so much for having me.